Adventure. An aircraft emergency at high altitude. This is tonight's story, The Cruel Sky, by Graham Lonsdale. Looks like we're in for a bad storm. You can say that again. Just look at the sky out there. Mm. Chucky 1 to Riverbridge Control Tower. Do you read me? Over. That's the call we're expecting from those two jets from Brown Hill Air Force Base. Have you got them on the scope? Yeah, they're approaching on P-51, 50,000 feet at Mac point eight. No other traffic. All clear. Riverbridge Control to Jockey 1. Five square. Over. Jockey 1 for flight 303, Brown Hill to Riverbridge. We have contact with your beacon. Permission requested for descent out of military flight path P-51 and approach to final. Over. Riverbridge Control to Jockey 1. You're cleared for descent and landing on runway two. Wind speed at ground level is force one. Hardly moving the sock. I think we're having the lull before the storm hits us. How's the weather up there? Over. We're well, experiencing tremendous turbulence. Heavy lightning. <laughs> we could sure do with some coffee when we get down. <laughs> Roger, Jockey One. Riverbridge Control out. Jockey One. I'll bet they could do with some coffee. <laughs> yeah, they'll be sure glad to get out of the turbulence up there. You know, a few years back, I was flying in the trainer through a bad storm. One moment, we were going along normally, and the next, we were all upside down. Uh-huh. The weather was tossing us around like a cork in a rough sea. Yes, I know what it's like. It can be pretty hairy. Yeah. Well, in a few minutes, those two will start descending, and they'll be home and dry. Sure. Yeah. Now what? That's Jockey 1's partner. Riverbridge Control to Jockey 2. Over. I've just been in a collision with Jockey 1. What? Collision? There's massive turbulence up here. I have control of my aircraft, but Jockey 1 is going down. Oh, wow. We can't raise him on the radio. Riverbridge to Jockey 1. Do you read me? Over. On the radar, there's a bleep going straight down. Yeah. He's in a dive. Jockey 2 is straight and level on P-51. Are you receiving me, Jockey 1? Riverbridge Control to Jockey 1. Over. Jockey 2. Did you see him eject from the aircraft? Are you kidding? We are at 50,000 feet. And Jockey 1 isn't wearing a pressure suit. If he ejects immediately, he's dead. Can you make it all right to Riverbridge? Yeah, I think so. My instruments are reading normal. I'll start an alert. Stand by for runway emergency. This is not an exercise. Repeat, this is not an exercise. Emergency landing on runway 2. Emergency landing on runway two. What's going on? Afternoon, Colonel Yelton. We were expecting two jet fighters from Brown Hill Air Force Base. Flight 303. We made normal radio and radar contact with them at 2030 hours. I see. And then? They were in military flight path P-51. Their altitude was 50,000 feet. Speed, Mach.8. Uh-huh. We cleared them for approach and landing. And then what happened? Well, it, it, it seems the turbulence in the storm caused them to collide. What? Holy yeah, Moses. Yeah, the codes are Jockey 1 and Jockey 2. Jockey 2 has retained control of his aircraft and is making his final now. And the other aircraft has crashed and went straight down. Well, did the collision take place at 50,000 feet? Yes, sir. Jockey 2 thinks there was an explosion aboard the other machine immediately after the collision. Well, did Jockey 1 eject? We don't know yet, sir, but it appears he wasn't wearing a pressure suit. Who says so? Jockey 2. Well, as soon as he's landed, I want to talk to him, yes, provided sir. he's not a hospital case. Yes, sir. Have you got a fix on where the other aircraft has come down? It went into open country west of here. A helicopter is on its way there now. If the pilot survived the collision, but if his aircraft was out of control at 50,000 feet, if he had to eject and he's not wearing a pressure suit... His chances of surviving aren't too good. No, they aren't. And he's falling through a raging storm. How are you feeling, son? I'm all right, thank you, sir. Just a bit shaken. 
Uh, the doctor checked me over. He says I'll do. Now, you said Jockey One started falling out of control. Well, the whole thing happened in an instant. There seemed to be, a, well, an explosion as our aircraft touched. I, I think his motor blew. I, I saw pieces of wreckage fly off his center fuselage. Now, if his motor went inoperative, he'd have had no hydraulic or electric power. For a start, he wouldn't be able to move the aircraft's control column. It looked to me like he was falling out of control, sir. How long is it since the collision? Uh, three quarters of an hour, sir. If Jockey One ejected at high altitude, he'd be in free fall until 10,000 feet. Mm -hmm. When his parachute would open automatically. Well, his body's rate of descent in free fall would be about 10,000 feet per minute. Yes, sir. And after the parachute opened, he'd be reduced to about 1,000 feet per minute. By now, he'd be on the ground somewhere. If he ejected very soon after the collision, the chances are that the high altitude may have killed him. All he was wearing was a light flying suit, gloves, shoes, and a helmet. The outside temperature at 50,000 feet today would be around 70 degrees below freezing. Yeah, and he'd start suffering from frostbite straight away. Plus the problem of sudden decompression. He was ten miles up. Maybe he was injured in the collision and didn't eject. If he rode the aircraft down, he's dead. For the moment, let's presume he ejected. And he'd probably have done so very soon after he realized his aircraft was out of control. You know, as he ejected from that aircraft, he'd be hurtling through the freezing air at 500 miles per hour. He'd lose consciousness. Well, maybe not. Even if he lost consciousness... His parachute would open automatically at 10,000 feet and break his fall. Yeah, but if he started his fall at 50,000 feet, he'd need oxygen. He was on 100% oxygen in the cockpit. Well, provided he retained consciousness, he could use the oxygen mask connected to an oxygen bottle in his parachute pack. It'd give him about five minutes supply on his way down. Uh -huh. But he'd have to be awake to put the mask over his face. He'd be falling at high speed, 10,000 feet per minute. He'd be subject to powerful gravity forces may have been injured when the aircraft collided. He would certainly have been injured by sudden decompression if he ejected at 50,000 feet. The question is, would he have the strength left to get the oxygen mask over his face? Without that oxygen, even if he survived the rest of the descent, he'd get brain damage. The brain has got to have sufficient oxygen. And all this doesn't sound as though he's got much chance. It would help if the storm wasn't going on and we could start a full search operation immediately. Can you imagine what a clap of thunder like that sounds like when you're falling through the clouds? Yeah. I suppose it could be enough to burst your eardrums. Well, he was wearing his helmet. That should deaden the sound a bit. Yes, probably. But all the same, the vibration must be tremendous. Falling through the sort of storm that's going on up there would be horrific. The thunder, the, the lightning, violent winds, on top of the cold and decompression. If he ejected safely and his parachute opened automatically at 10,000 feet be falling through torrential rain. The rain plus up and down drafts of wind could, well, it could collapse a parachute. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if a man could drown up there. Drown? Is that possible? I'm not sure, but he could start gulping in water. He wasn't falling through a light shower, you know. Now listen, I've never met anybody who's parachuted from 50,000 feet without a pressure suit through a tremendous storm on top of it. But we are going to think positively about this. Maybe the rescue helicopter will have good news. X-31 to Riverbridge Control Tower. Do you read me? Over. Ah, that's the rescue helicopter calling in. Let's hear what he's got to say. Riverbridge Control Tower to X-ray 1. Five square. Over. I'm at the scene of the Jockey 1 crash. One mile east of Plan River Curve. Now, how does it look? Over. Scattered wreckage. Do you know if the pilot ejected? Over. Negative. We don't know yet. How's the weather where you are? Over. Lashing rain. Just after we got here, the wind whipped up to force seven. We've secured the chopper to the ground with cables. And the Met report states that the storm will blow over in an hour or so. Harrison, tell him to commence an air search for the pilot when the weather permits. Yes, sir. Riverbridge to X-ray one. Orders from Colonel Yalton. Start an air search for the pilot as soon as the weather permits. Over. Roger, Riverbridge. Will do. Riverbridge control tower out. I'm surprised the chopper found the wreckage so quickly in this weather. Well, they must have come across the wreckage before the storm deteriorated. I've got two further helicopters on standby. As soon as this infernal storm passes, we'll mount a full search operation. I'd like to come along if that's all right with you, sir. You, uh, you feel up to it? Uh, yes, sir. Well, we won't be able to leave for at least another half hour or so. See the doctor again, tell him you want to fly as an observer in the rescue search. If he says okay, I'll take you with me. Well, I feel fine, sir. Talk to the doctor. Yes, sir. 
Well, he's game for a man who's just survived a mid-air collision. He's worried about his friend. Wouldn't you be in his place? I think the rain's easing off a bit out there. I was thinking it... Excuse me. Riverbridge Control Tower. There's a break in the clouds over there. See it? Yes. It won't be much longer and the storm will have passed. It was a particularly bad one. Must have been hell up there. Hey, about... Yes, sir. Hell's the word for it. Yeah. If the man we've got to find has reached the ground alive, he's going to need yeah, medical right. attention yeah, urgently. <clears throat> yeah, I got it. Right, thanks. Who's on the phone? Operations room. They've heard from the highway patrol at Plan River Curve. Police have found aircraft wreckage on the road. Was anybody hurt when it came down? Fortunately not. No injuries or damage to property. Yeah, uh, apart from the road, that is. They say the storm over there had been freaky. For a few minutes, the wind was blowing a full gale. Force 10. It appears Mother Nature went off ahead for a while. Good grief. But as I said, it only lasted a few minutes. When it eased, the police started searching the road and found pieces of aircraft wreckage. The road is some distance from where X-Way 1 has found the main body of wreckage. Yeah. It seems like the aircraft was breaking up as it came down. At the time of the collision, Jockey 2 said he thought there was an explosion. Well, could the police give a section ID on the wreckage? Yeah. They said it looked like parts of a wing. Mm. Well, it seems less and less likely the pilot will be found alive. Listen, don't write him off yet, Harrison. The resilience of the human body never ceases to amaze me. But we're talking about a man who may have ejected at 50,000 feet without a pressure suit, into racking decompression, lack of oxygen, viciously low temperatures, and a raging storm. I'm aware of that. Can the human body withstand that sort of treatment? I don't know what the odds are. I'd say very small at the most. Agreed, Harrison. But don't underestimate the human machine. Until we've got proof to the contrary... We are going to assume the pilot is alive and waiting to be rescued. And that's an order. X-ray 2 calling Riverbridge Control Tower. Do you read me? Over. Riverbridge Control Tower to X-ray 1. Five square, over. I've joined the search pattern with helicopters X-ray 1 and X-ray 3. Roger, X-ray 2. At least the rain stopped. Yeah. Visibility's pretty good now. Keep your eyes peeled. Well, he may have spread his parachute on the ground as a marker. Not unless he came down in a tree. Well, let's hope not. With the wind carrying him along... He could hit the tree at 50 miles per hour. Fortunately, there aren't many trees around here. I hope this is the area where he came down. The storm may have carried him miles away, 20 or 30 miles, or well, even more. Who knows? It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. But even a needle in a haystack will be found if you look carefully enough. And provided we're looking in the right haystack. Uh, we'll soon be up against another problem, too. Well, what's that, sir? It's going to be nightfall soon. If we don't find him in the next hour or so, we'll have to call off the search until daylight tomorrow. Yeah, but if he's still alive, he'll be in need of hospital attention as quickly as possible. I know. To think that he may have survived that terrible descent. Just to die alone out there in the wild somewhere during the night. We've got to find him. Now keep swinging those binoculars. Yet? No, nothing. And it'll be dark in a few minutes. Yeah. They'll have to call it off till tomorrow. Well, maybe when they... I'll get it. Control tower. Yeah. Yeah, I see. We'll let them know. Thanks. That was a report passed on from the team collecting wreckage at the crash site. Now, what did they say? They managed to find most of the main bits and pieces from the cockpit section of the fuselage. But there's no sign of the ejection seat or the body of the pilot. Oh. Then it looks like he did eject. Yeah, it seems so. I'll pass the information on to Colonel Yalton. A river bridge control tower to X-ray 2. Do you read me? Over. X-ray 2, five square over. A report from the crew at the crash site states that the main sections of the cockpit have been recovered. 
There was no sign of the ejection seat or the pilot. Over. So he made it out of the aircraft. I knew it. He must be down somewhere. We've got a few more minutes of life, and then we'll have to return to base. I'll let you know when we turn back. Over. Roger X-ray 2. River Bridge out. You know, if we're realistic about this, what chances are the pilot's lying dead on his parachute somewhere. You heard what Yelton said earlier this afternoon. Until the body's found, we're going to believe the man's still alive. Well, that's like sitting at the fireplace on Christmas night waiting for Santa Claus. It just isn't going to happen. Why are you so set against considering that the pilot may have survived? Well, I'll tell you why. Some years ago, I did a stint at Hurton Air Base, where they've got a high-altitude research institute. I know what'll happen to somebody who ejects at 50,000 feet without a precious... Are you saying you know of an actual case? Well, no, not exactly, Uh, but I've seen simulated... That's just theory. Not entirely. Medical research has proved under simulated conditions that a man without a pressure suit at such high altitude would almost certainly be killed. Theoretically. Listen to me for a minute, will you? Why do you think pressure suits were designed in the first place? And the pilot Yelton is looking for it wasn't wearing one. Sure, but still... But whole... nothing. I know what I'm talking about. Listen, do you want to know what really happens to a man who leaves an aircraft at 50,000 feet without a pressure suit? I can see you're going to tell me anyway. Well, for a start... The pain from sudden decompression would be excruciating. The medieval torture rack couldn't compare with it. I believe you, but... Your those... eyes would feel like they'd been ripped out. And you'd start bleeding through the ears, the nose, and the mouth. Your stomach would expand like a balloon. I said I'd take your word for it. In addition to the horror I've just mentioned, the temperature up there was 70 degrees below freezing. Plus the shock of ejecting from the aircraft and hurtling along at 500 miles an hour. Plus lack of oxygen if you couldn't beat the G-forces and get your oxygen mask on. Knock it off, will you? You wanted to know why I don't think that pilot got to the ground alive. Well, now I've told you. X-ray 2 calling Riverbridge Control Tower. Over. Riverbridge Control Tower to X-ray 2. Five square. Over. The light's gone. I'm bringing the formation home. X-ray 1, 2, and 3 will approach along the north-south helicopter corridor. Our ETA approximately 60 minutes. Over. Roger, X-ray 2. So they've had to pack it in. They were only looking for a dead man. Believe me, I'm sure of it. Come here, boy. Ah, that was quite a storm we just had. I never known anything like it around here. I guess we were lucky to keep the roof on the place. Ah, I better check over the place to make sure. Yes, yeah, sir, that guttering looks like it needs some fixing. <laughs> ah, well, let's take a look around the side of the house. Come on, boy. Now, what are you barking at? There's nothing out there in the dark, stupid dog. Come here, will you? There's one thing I can't abide by, and that's a dog barking at nothing. All right, all right. Now, let me sweep the flashlight around a bit. Darn if I can see anything for you to be barking at. There's nothing out there, boy. Seems like you're barking at something up that tree. There's no cats around here. Well, <laughs> let's take a closer look, shall we? <laughs> Maybe you've seen a snake in the tree, huh? Well, you just keep away from it. You mind your business, and the snake of mine is. Now then, what's it about this tree that you find so mighty interesting, huh? Oh, help me. What, what was that? Up here, in the tree. I oh, bless my soul. There's a voice calling from the tree. Up here, overhead. Hey, let me get my flashlight settled on you, fella. Land sakes. It's a man dangling by one of them parachute contraptions. Help me. I heard something on the radio about a plane crash. Was that your plane, fella? I'm hurt. Please, get me out of this tree. <laughs> I'm sorry, fella. I'm too old to be climbing up trees. And anyway, I don't have a ladder that'll reach you. I'll phone for the sheriff at Snake Rock now. Now, you hold on up there. Now then, where is that in here? Hello? Hello? Darn this instrument. 
Hello? Hello? Hello, Agnes? You hear me? Good. Now listen, there's a man dangling by a parachute in one of my trees. You know, a man in a tree. Uh, reckon he could be from that plane crash they were talking about on the radio. <laughs> well, he looks mighty bad. He's just a mess of blood. Uh, look, get the sheriff out here, will you? And the doctor, pronto. Hey, fella, you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Uh, the, the, the sheriff will be here. Should take him about ten minutes now. Now, you hold on there, you hear me? You hear me, fella? The, the sheriff's on his way out here. Excuse me, Colonel. We just had a call via the police at Plan River Curve. Well, they found him. The sheriff at Snake Rock reported a call from an old man who lives alone on a farm about ten yeah, miles come on, come out on. of Snake Rock. The old man said he'd found someone dangling by a parachute in a tree. It's the pilot. Yeah. Was he alive? The general hospital at Plan River Curve has sent an air ambulance to pick him up. That's all we know at the moment. I see. We'd better not set our hopes up. For the sounds of it, the ambulance may only find a body dangling from that tree. found him over at Snake Rock. Yeah, that's right. Was he alive? Well, the last we heard was that an air ambulance was picking him up. He'll be flown to the general hospital of Plan River Curve. It's the closest. Well, when was he found? About half an hour ago. Well, there should be some news by now. Can't they check with the hospital? Well, take it easy. When there's some news, it'll go straight through to Colonel Yalton. He'll tell us. So we don't know if he's... He... No news is sometimes good news, okay? Well, if he was dead when the air ambulance got there... Well, we'd have known, surely, by now. Ah, take it easy, huh? I'm sure I know, but I was up there in the collision. I saw his aircraft start going down. We were personal friends. Has his wife been told? I didn't know he was married. Anyway, Colonel Yelton will handle that sort of thing. Married two kids. If she's got to be told he's dead, I'll ask Yelton to let me do it. Hey, look, haven't you had enough of one day? It was a freaky accident. We were flying at a safe distance from each other, and suddenly it was... Like we were being hurled towards each other by some crazy tornado. It was weird. You should get some rest, okay? I can't rest until I hear if he's alive. We'll let you know as soon as we hear something. Now, why don't you... Good evening, gentlemen. Colonel... Has there been any further news, sir? Yes. For a start, the ambulance crew had a job getting him down from that tree. Is he alive, sir? Yes. In fact, <sighs> once they got him out of the tree, he was able to walk across to the ambulance. He insisted. Wow. He said that after all the way he'd come, he was going to walk the rest of it. <laughs> what? He walked to the ambulance? We're talking about a pretty tough customer. Oh, we must have overestimated the altitude at which he ejected. Well, he says he ejected at just over 46,000 feet. And well, that's very near 50,000 that we supposed. What are his injuries, sir? Cuts, bruises, frostbite, disjointed shoulder, some loss of equilibrium, hemorrhaging in one eye, bleeding through the ears, nose and throat. I, uh... I hear he wasn't a pretty sight. Well, he obviously took a hammering on the way down. Yeah, but fortunately, he managed to get his portable oxygen supply working. He got the mask over his face. Will he ever be fit enough to return to flying duty, sir? Well, there's a flock of medical specialists taking care of him. I spoke to one of the doctors on the phone. He says they're amazed that the injuries weren't a lot worse. But will he fly again? <laughs> Look, he's receiving the best possible medical attention. Plus, the human body's own considerable powers of recovery. So, the answer may well turn out to be yes. I'd, uh, I'd like to make a public apology. Oh? Uh -huh. I honestly thought he'd never make it to the ground alive. <laughs> Don't apologize. You can buy us each a beer in the mess. Uh, sure. I, uh, I think a small celebration would be in order. With pleasure, sir. With <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> High Adventure is produced by Henry Duffenthal.